I'm Kevin McDonald, and you're listening to the great, big, beautiful podcast. This is the big, great, beautiful. You're listening to a beautiful podcast. You know what? You're listening to a beautiful podcast that happens to be a great, big, beautiful podcast. I'm Kevin McDonald still. Thank you very much. Keep listening. Have you ever been to Disneyland? Affirmative. That was definitely an e-ticket. I can't believe all the new gadgets they've got now. For a while, we didn't even have a house phone, not to mention laser discs, high-def TV. You are listening to The Great Big Beautiful Podcast. This week on the show... And one day I, I got this call um, from the front desk and they said, David Willardson is here to meet with Kara Fox and he's here to show his portfolio and Kara forgot about the meeting. So can you meet with him? Now, David Willardson was one of my idols. So suddenly, not only am I about to meet him, but I'm supposed to look at, look at and <laughs> his judge. portfolio. Look out. Here are your hosts, Jamie Green and Justin Connors. Welcome to the Great Big Beautiful Podcast. Facebook.com slash the GBB Podcast. Twitter at the GBB Podcast. And in your ears right now, wherever you found us. iTunes, Google Play, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? You got us from somewhere. Somewhere. And thank you to that someplace for guiding (laughs) a valuable listener. To our our little home and geekdad.com obviously that's probably where most of you are coming from let's be honest yeah. <laughs> so this week on the great big beautiful podcast we are not going to do small talk you're, you're, no small talk you are not going to get any small talk i'm just joking. boy i'm excited why why no small well, talk i'm today? just jo- i'm just joking oh um, are we just talk now i, I want to talk about something jamie you just got tickets to an interesting concert <laughs> We're I did. It's completely it. unrelated to our guest today. Oh, but it's it is. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're doing some small talk. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Um, you know, if if you've not heard of Stranger Things at this point, you're very likely living in North Korea. Um, <laughs> and in that case, I don't know how you're listening to us. Um, but the one of the uh, standout aspects of that show was the music. You mm-hmm. know, the, the, the opening credits and then the music throughout the show. Um, w- it's kind of cliche to say the music was like a character, but it it, right. it really lent um, that bit of 80s nostalgia to the show. I mean, the music was so on point and it was just really, really good. Um, I like that kind of music anyway. So, you know, from the very first episode, um, I was hooked just because right. of the music. Uh, well, the band, that band that plays that music, they're an actual band that actually plays in that style they're called survive all in caps so i'm not really sure if it's an acronym for something (laughs) um but they're they have a new cd coming out and it's all instrumental you know synth keyboard type music just Mm -hmm. like you hear in the show um and they're going on a tour and i'm going to see them at the end of october in dc so i'm kind of excited that's so cool that's so cool interesting I, I, I think that, that you're going to be people dressing up in costumes to go to you it. Think, oh, should I dress up like 11? I've got the hair yes, for it. Yes, you should. Totally. You should wear <laughs> 80s clothing, too. Yeah. I might dress up as 11. That would be yeah, awesome. That'd be cool. That'd be pretty I've never cosplayed before, but I think that that feels like a very weird <laughs> place to start. <laughs> Do it, do it. Just show Especially up. Especially that like, would be cross dressing cosplay. Look I feel around good. and be like, I thought this was like a <laughs> like, like a costumed event. <laughs> well, you know, it is um, three days before Halloween, so it would be there fitting. There you go, do it. I, I want I'll pictures. Think about it. All right. So now that small talk is over, <laughs> <laughs> we've talked small. Let's we move talk on. small. Who we have on the podcast this week, Jamie? Let us know. This- this week we're talking to Bill Morrison, um, who, if you don't know his name, you know his work. He was one of the founding um, founding fathers. Can we say that? He was one of the founders of uh, Bongo Comics with Matt Groening. And Bongo is the once and only home of the Simpsons comics. So uh, he was um, involved way back when on the Simpsons. He was one of the the guiding forces of Bongo, um, involved in a ton of Simpsons and Futurama. He uh, has his own things. He's got, uh, okay, stop. Because I don't want to just fuzz here. Yeah, no worries. 
And even before even before he was involved with Bongo, he uh, did quite a bit of work with Disney. He did a lot of the um, how to say like the promotional art. So he he didn't work for Disney proper, but like when mm -hmm. when Disney would come out with video releases and they need new art for the VHS you know box or new poster art to promote the video release he 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 was working for the firm that had the contract for all of that art and if you've ever heard the story about the uh, <laughs> the infamous little, little mermaid poster with the phallic symbol in the background of you the know cast, you've heard of it you know you've heard the story that you know and you've heard all kinds of uh urban legends about that it was placed there on purpose and it was a disgruntled employee who had gotten fired so he put a penis in the castle and all the you know you've heard all these stories well ladies and gentlemen bill morrison is the man who actually drew drew right. the poster and you better believe we asked him about it oh absolutely, absolutely. i mean this is at this point this is a question he's fielded probably hundreds of times mm -hmm. um the answer may surprise you um, but, uh, I'm not going to tell you what the answer is. No, you gotta listen. no, no. <laughs> they gotta listen to find that you out. Gotta listen. But this is the guy who is, he was the man who actually sat down at the easel and painted that poster and, and ended up with a penis in the castle and all those moms back in the nineties, um, furious at Disney. Right. Uh, and, and the story he tells his fans, seriously, it's, it's a, it really, I, I, it surprised me. I was like, oh wow, that's what it was. Cool. So you yeah. really want to listen and hear it. And we're playing Mythbusters today, so we're busting the myth. <laughs> nice. That's what we're doing. Jamie's Adam and I, No, no, I'm Adam and you're uh, you're Jamie. I'm Jamie. <laughs> nice. <laughs> you just need a mustache. I'll work on that. Yeah. I'll work on that. <laughs> All right, guys. So that's just a small part of the interview, but it's cool. <laughs> so yeah. we're gonna no, it's, a, it's a great conversation. We really do cover his career. Um right. we talk a lot about uh you know, his Disney days, his Simpsons days, and what he's been up to since. Perfect. So we're going to play that for you right now. Enjoy. Bill, thanks for taking the time to chat with us today. Um, this is this is going to be a lot of fun, I hope. <laughs> I wanted to start off, um, I don't think it's so much of a, as a curveball, but sort of a going back to the beginning. But uh, I'm curious if you remember the first thing that you ever drew. Um, I don't really remember it, but I, I have a drawing of my family, which I think I drew in kindergarten. And that's the first thing that I can really pinpoint. Uh, I'm sure I did drawings before then, but, um, this particular drawing is kind of funny because it's like a lineup of my family. I think it must've been something my teacher asked us to all to draw. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Everybody's just kind of like facing front and smiling, except for my mother, who's turned to the side at the sink and she's doing dishes. And you can see that originally I had a smile on her face and then for some reason I erased it and then drew a frown. OK. And I don't know if that was myself just going, oh, it would be funnier if she was frowning or <laughs> if maybe my mom looked at it and said, I would never be happy doing the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> That's not something that I would like to do. <laughs> yeah. But, but I was, I was either, I either self art directed or, I, or I was art directed by somebody to change it. And That's also funny. I, I must've drawn like from the head down on all the figures because when I drew myself, I drew myself too tall cause I'm standing next to my older brother. Okay. And you know, by the time I got down to my feet, I, I guess I realized, well, I can't my, make my legs longer because I'm not that tall. So I drew a little hill. <laughs> to make I remember me, doing that. You start yeah. the heads at the same place and then you realize that you get, you know, so you're like, oh, let's just put a hill there. That's what I'm standing on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so your training, though, um, is in illustration, correct? Yes. Yeah. So and, and unless I'm mistaken, you've done a little bit of everything. It looks like you've done your know, technical art, fine art, advertising. What led ultimately to comics and why did you just I mean, was it were the, was it the opportunities that that you were afforded that and you ended up making a career there or was it something else? Yeah, it was really happenstance um, more than anything. Uh, as a kid, I my dream was to be a comic book artist. And 
um, because I grew up in Detroit, there weren't really opportunities to do that professionally, uh, which is why I went into technical illustration because that's pretty much all there was when I got um, when I got out of art school. Mm-hmm. And I had this strange fear of New York, which was where at the time all the comic books were being produced. And I think the fear was based largely on um, movies and television. Because every time New York was depicted back in the 70s, it was always crime-ridden and drug-ridden. Scary place. Yeah, it was a really mm-hmm. scary place. So I was like, okay, I'm not going to New York. I can't see myself living there. But uh, eventually I came out to California because probably about my third year of art school, I had a teacher who was really into the California airbrush art style that was happening. Okay. And so he used to bring in all these examples of movie posters and greeting cards and album covers. And that really turned me on. So I started pushing my portfolio more in that direction. And uh, California seemed like a a good place to to live, easy place to live. And I was into the kind of art that was being done out here. So I I had to sort of just put aside the desired to, to be a comic book artist. And I thought, you know, maybe someday, but it's just not happening right now. I'm going to go into illustration. And then um, it was really because of my acquaintance with Matt Groening mm-hmm. and his desire to start a comic book company that that ended up happening. You, you were one of the co-founders of, of the com- Bongo Comics with Matt Groening and um, can you give a story in the nutshell, like give it a nutshell story of how that came to be? Well, um, I was hired in 1990, just shortly after the Simpsons, um, started the primetime show. Right. So they'd been on the Tracy Ullman show for a couple of years. And, a, a woman who was uh, close friends with Matt Groening, who I had worked with when I was doing movie post movie poster advertising, um, she contacted me and said, Hey, I'm working with Matt on the Simpsons. Would you like to do some freelance art? So uh, I was already a fan of the show. So of course I said, yes. And I started freelancing and within about six months, um, Fox was really happy with the stuff that I was doing. It was all art for merchandise. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Primarily, but also some advertising and publicity stuff. And um, so anyway, I was hired to work for Fox to create merchandise art and um, also to art direct some other artists. And that was that was separate from publishing with The Simpsons, because when Matt made his deal with Fox, he retained all the publishing rights. So I was getting paid by Fox um, for the merchandise, but then there was all this other art that needed to be done that was, um, related to books and magazines and calendars, everything that fell under publishing that was all being done, um, through Matt. So I started taking on freelance work, working for him. And one of the things that we did early on was a magazine called Simpsons Illustrated. And within the pages of Simpsons Illustrated, we had a comic section. And Steve Vance and Cindy Vance and Matt and I really, we all grew up wanting to draw comics. That was really our passion. Mm -hmm. So that was our favorite part of the magazine. And uh, we had done an annual issue the first year, which was a 3D issue. And uh, so it was coming time to start thinking about the second annual and we, um, I, I don't know whose idea it was, but somebody said, Hey, we're, you know, the comic section is expanding. We're obviously having fun with the comics. Let's just do an all comic version or an all comic issue. So that was uh, Simpsons comics and stories. Yeah. Uh, first, very first Simpsons comic book. And uh, that was so successful that it sort of gave Matt the confidence to, um, go out and start a comic book company. Um, he'd been he'd been approached by all the majors to do Simpsons comics for for a couple of years at that point. This is ni- 1993. Yeah, it seems and, like it seems interesting. I don't mean to cut you off, but it seems interesting that that the 
comics at that point was almost an afterthought. You know, whereas today it would have been like, okay, that's one of the first you know pieces of tie-in merchandise that we're going to do is we're going to we'll do a comic book. Well, I I think the reason for that is because Matt really he didn't want to just hand off the Simpsons to Marvel or DC or another company and let them do it. He really wanted to be involved in it, and but he wasn't quite ready to start his own company, so. That's why I think it took a couple of years, but it was that it was that one issue and the sales from that issue that made yeah. him realize, okay, this is a viable thing. Let's sure. do it. Yeah. Um, the Simpsons as a show is routinely held up as one of those, you know, it's one of the biggest success stories ever, and it's kind of unbelievable that we're coming up on the twenty eighth season. I think. I know. Um, it's 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 kind of crazy. You know, people that don't follow it, they they're sort of at a loss but like it's still on the sh- on, on TV. Yeah, it's 28 years it's been running. But what I think is even more mind-blowing is that there have been more than 230 issues of the monthly comic book. And that's not even counting all the spin-offs, miniseries and one-shots and everything else that 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 have been done. From your experience in your many many years there, how do you keep it after that many stories? How do you keep it fresh and interesting? Well, one of the things that we have um, sort of going for us is there are so many characters on The Simpsons. It's not a small cast. Right. So there are lots of uh, d- characters and very different characters. So there are plenty of um, things to sort of springboard off of character-wise. Um, and then also The Simpsons was really set up as a satirical um, vehicle for our society, for our culture. So, um, you know, new things are happening every day. And then we've got hundreds of years of, of just, you know, situations that make for good stories and good comedy. So the, I guess the trick is to, is not really to come up with ideas, but to, um, to sort of Simpsonize those ideas and present them in a way that is, um, you know, that makes sense for The Simpsons. Mm-hmm. You were, um, with during your time at Bongo, you were the editor and creative director for, almost, was it almost or more than 20 years? It was about 18 years, I 18 think. 18 years, yeah. yeah. Um, the, I, and I know the title of editor in the comic industry carries a lot of different meetings and responsibilities. So yeah. specific to you and Bongo, what did it mean for you? Like, what were your duties and and for the company and for the different books that you oversaw? Well, uh, when I, I, I started with the company when, when we created it as art director and Steve Vance was the editor. Mm-hmm. And then when Steve left after the first year, um, I had, you know, I'd never been an editor. Um, I was sort of one of those artists who became editors like Carmine Infantino or, or mm-hmm. Dick Giordano. Um, so I had to sort of just figure the job out as I went and for, for our company and as small as it was, um, the editor was basically uh, quality control. So, you know, I was, I was still drawing covers and I was drawing stories and writing stories when I had time, but mostly I was, um, uh, getting pitches from writers and, um, you know, making notes on the pitches, either accepting or rejecting them. And then once I got the first draft scripts in, it was just going through and making notes. You know, Homer would never say this. Um, you know, motivation is wrong here. Uh, continuity doesn't make sense. Um, so, so it was just kind of uh, guiding the writer through the process of writing a good Simpson story. Yeah. And um, after after we cultivated some regular writers, you know, that um, wasn't as difficult of a job as it was at first, but. Um, and in the early days before we had an art director, when I was both editing and art directing, it was also going through all the, the pencil pages and uh, making Xeroxes of those and then just doing drawings over top of the characters to put them on model. Kind of what John Romita would do for Marvel, mm-hmm. um, you know, just putting everything on model and um, changing some of the staging when it needed to be changed and. Um, it was it was a pretty big job in the early days. I mean, you you touch on this a little bit. I mean, a lot of the you had a lot of different artists that worked in the books, and they were not 
necessarily the same people who worked on the show. Right. Um, so to get them all on the same page, to get the characters on model, how difficult was it to ensure a consistent look? Well, luckily, because of the show, we had uh, an extensive model pack for all the characters. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of great pages that were created by David Silverman and some of the other directors um, that just showed things like, you know, you never cross the eyes. The pupils, you know, are can't be too small or too big. Um, you know, the relationship of Homer's nose um, or the position of Homer's nose in relationship to his ear. You know, don't make the ear too low or don't make it too high. Yeah. Um, all all these kinds of great notes for standardizing the characters existed from the show and they shared those with us. Um, so yeah, basically we would just hand those out to the, the artists and, um, hopefully they would follow them and, um, pick up on all the nuances. Yeah. So basically those notes and I mean, uh, that Bible, I guess you could call it the character Bible for what, characters are supposed to look like and the rules that you can't break that was the that was the training that new artists would get to make sure that they could mimic those designs and style yeah and eventually we put out a book at bongo called the simpsons handbook which is uh basically how to draw the simpsons hardcover book Mm -hmm. and um, that was sort of a dream of mine because these sheets were sort of scattered all over and not you know in a real organized um form Mm-hmm. Um, and I wanted a book that I could just hand to an artist and just say, here, yeah. read this and <laughs> learn it, and, <laughs> and you'll be fine. <laughs> and people could just go to the store and buy, and then when they came to you looking for a job, they'd already know all those secrets. Yeah, uh, and a lot of times people would say, hey, I'd like to try out for, you know, pen- uh, I'd like to be a penciler for Bongo, uh-huh. and I would direct them to that book, you know, yeah. before they That's even convenient. sent us a pencil <laughs> test, yeah. Um. After 18 years of working with those same characters, I mean, like you said, there's a big cast, but, you know, I mean, the core family and some of the core characters appear quite a bit more often than others. Did you ever just get tired of them and want to do something else or want to draw something else? Um, I never I never really had that situation come up because Matt Groening, from the very beginning, he encouraged all of us to do our own things. Mm hmm. He said, you know, get your work done and, you know, don't take away from what you're doing for Bongo. But, you know, if you've got an, an idea for something you want to do and, you know, work on it in your spare time and then show it to me. And if it's right for Bongo, we'll publish it. That's how Roswell came about. And um, I did an Avengers story for Marvel once. And Matt really encouraged me to go off and do that. Um, so little things like that really helped to keep it fresh so that. It wasn't just day after day after day of The Simpsons. And then, of course, when Futurama came along, yeah, um, that helped, you know, add some variety. Right. Yeah. So you mentioned your series, Roswell, uh, Little Green Man. It was the first bongo title from outside The Simpsons and Futurama universe. Was there a lot of pressure associated with that in making it succeed? Um, no, I wouldn't say any real pressure. I mean... Maybe maybe pressure that I put on myself right. to, to try to make it as good as possible because I really wanted it to be a big hit. Um, but as far as Bongo was concerned, it was it was just more, hey, you know, we think this is great. We're going to put it out and, you know, hopefully it'll resonate with people and be a hit. Um, do you have any plans to bring it? didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, do, you, do you have any plans to bring it back? Yes, actually, um, you know, it hasn't been announced yet, so I, I don't feel comfor- comfortable mm-hmm. <laughs> um, saying the name of the publisher, but it's one of the major publishers, and um, they oh, nice. contracted me to do a new Roswell story, and, awesome. and if, it, if it swings, then, you know, maybe there'll be a whole new series. Excellent. I mean, I don't know if you can say, but... Um, are you talking just a miniseries right now or, or potential for ongoing, leaving it um, open? Right now, it would be a one-shot thing. Okay. And, and then, um, you know, if it's if it's successful, then there's the chance that it could be a, an ongoing series or maybe... I've, I've always liked... Um, I like miniseries. 
I mean, I, I sort of think in terms of graphic novels when I do stories. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I would be great with just putting out a trade book from the get go. Um, but I understand that publishers sometimes need to put out the 32 page floppies first and then, mm -hmm. and then collect those. And that's fine too. But as I'm creating it and writing it, I'm thinking in terms of, you know, this will be a graphic novel mm -hmm. and, and um, that's that's what I would like. I'd like to see just a series of mini series or, or yeah. direct graphic novel stories. That come. Well, I, I wanted to ask you about that too because you, you mentioned the the difference in in reading and buying habits for between monthlies and you know the trade paperback. Um, and it seems I don't know if it's a recent development, but at least within the last five years or so, trades have really picked up in popularity in over the monthly titles. And I know a lot of readers are holding off on readings. So they're several months behind either because, you know, that's how they read it, you know, through a subscription service or they just wait for the trade. Um, as, as somebody who, you know, writes and draws and creates these stories, um, it's got to be a different, a different way to approach the storytelling and, the, and the, the character arcs and the beats between, okay, are you going to read 32 pages and then wait a month and then have to read the next 32 pages? Or is somebody going to sit down and read, you know, 150 pages all at once? Mm -hmm. I mean, how, how do you approach the two different ways, especially now when people could be reading either way? Well, I, I think back in the days when uh, most comics were done in one, mm-hmm. And, you know, before Marvel sort of pioneered the soap opera form and everything was continued next issue, um, it kind of made sense to just have a comic come out every month. And then, you know, if you missed an issue, it didn't really make a big difference, um, you know, because you didn't have that continuity break. Um, but now that that's really not the norm, except for us, <laughs> I mean, I think the the Simpsons and Futurama were one of the only companies that do self-contained stories. Yeah. Um, but for, for any other type of comic, I mean, it's like binge watching a TV show on Netflix. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, what people want these days, I think more, more so than anything else, they want to get the whole story all in one sitting. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if it makes sense for a publisher to break that story up into four or six parts and, you know, then later on come out with the complete version. You know, I get that economically, you, you got to do what makes sense if you're a publisher. But as a creator, I think I'm, and I, I'm probably speaking for most creators, most writers, uh, it's, it's much more satisfying to come up with the whole story and get it all out there and then have people react to it. Mm -hmm. Sure. I can see that, definitely. It's sort of like, you know, back in the old days of uh, movie houses, when you'd have the serialized stories, yeah, you know, you'd have you'd have a chapter of Batman or um, Flash Gordon or something. Yeah, um, you know that was that was they were basically doing TV episodes before TV was invented. Yeah, and. It, it, it's it slows down. I'm mean, not necessarily, but the the danger you can run into, and I mean, this is not like a new thing. Monthly comics are not a new thing, obviously, but the danger with telling a story over eight or nine issues over eight or nine months is that invariably you've got to spend either a page or a panel or references. You've got to go back and remind the reader about what happened before, and that could potentially slow down your storytelling. And it's, I would imagine that's to an extent, frustrating. You know, TV can get around that by the last time on whatever, and they just do a little, you know, compilation of, of clips. But when you're reading a monthly book and you just got the 32 pages of, you know, this month's story in hand, you may not necessarily remember what happened the last four months. Yeah. And so the, you've got to bring the reader up to speed. And so in that respect, I can see how either a done in one or a trade paperback that collects the entire story arc is a lot more satisfying. Yeah, I I just recently did a series for Dark Horse called Dead Vengeance, mm -hmm. and it was a four issue series. And I I tried to creatively um, remind the reader within the 
to dialogue of of subsequent issues, what happened in the previous issue. Um, so I, I know some companies do, like they'll devote the inside front cover to, right. uh, you know, last time in Spider-Man or whatever. Right. Marvel does that a lot. Yeah. Um, or the first page mm -hmm. will be devoted to that. But I, um, you know, I didn't have that luxury. Dark Horse didn't give me that page and I didn't, didn't really have it to waste. So I just tried to work in things in the dialogue and the narrative that would remind people of the important things that happened. Yeah. And, but but the art of that is, um, it's like if you've ever read a collection of newspaper comic strips, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. especially the Teelys, if it's a, an adventure strip, um, every day they would have to remind the reader what happened the day before. And with four, four panels, that's kind of hard to do. <laughs> yeah, so like the, the first panel was always kind of the same as the last panel of the previous day. Yeah. Which, you know, was was okay when you're reading it day by day, but when you're reading a collection, it gets, you know, gets kind of tedious. <laughs> um, so you want to avoid that, you know, the for the trade version, the collected version, you want to avoid this experience where the reader's going, yeah, 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 I just read that. Yeah. Okay, yeah, move exactly. Hmm. I want to go back a bit to um, your time before Bongo. Uh, you did a lot of uh, promotional work, and you, I know you worked on a lot of uh, Disney films, and you painted a lot of the posters for their re-release or video releases. Um, how did that was that was one of the first um, the first art jobs that you got after moving to California, right? Well, the first job I got was at a place in Hollywood that um, it was sort of a boutique ad agency that just specialized in movie advertising. And I did a ton of, um, I was, I was young and I was like the in-house illustrator and most of the, the poster art was done by freelancers, but every so often we would get a really low budget, um, kind of like before there was such a thing as direct to DVD mm -hmm. or direct to video, there was direct to the drive-in movie theater. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there were a lot, of, a lot of schlocky low budget movies that would never make it into a, a walk-in theater, but you'd see them at the drive-in. So lots of horror movies and teen sex comedies. And um, so I did a bunch of posters for those, but then I also worked on some big campaigns in the preliminary stages. And then you know, the sketches that I would do would go on to a, a more seasoned illustrator. Um, so that was, I did that for about four years before I went to the studio where I started doing the Disney stuff. Um, how, how did you, how'd you land that gig? That was kind of weird. Uh, the, the, um, okay. So I'm working in this ad agency in Hollywood and it's owned by a guy whose wife has a little subsidiary company that does greeting cards. So okay. she, she's kind of set up in the back of the studio and she has this little office. And one day I, I got this call um, from the front desk and they said, David Willardson is here to meet with Kara Fox. She's the, the wife of the owner. Mm -hmm. And he's here to show his portfolio and Kara forgot about the meeting. So can you meet with him? Now, David Willardson was one of my idols. Um, okay. He's an illustrator. If you've ever seen the American Graffiti album cover. Yeah. The Waitress on the Roller Skates, he did that. Yeah. Awesome. He, he was like the, one of the two or three main guys who were doing this California airbrush style that I was so enamored of. And so suddenly, not only am I about to meet him, but I'm supposed to look at look at <laughs> his uh, portfolio <laughs> so you know trying to wrap my head around that so you know i try to play it cool and i you know meet him and looking at his book and i'm trying to say the things that i think an art director is supposed to say and um we were in my office so i had a poster on the wall of one of the films that i had just done it was a it was like an art house film called choose me okay and uh, it was this like slick airbrush image of a girl talking on a pink telephone, like very close up of her face. So you see like the pink lipstick and the, you know, glistening pink telephone and her, her nails were all pink and shiny. 
and it was it was like this very slick airbrush piece and uh dave said to me did you paint that and i said yeah and he said oh i thought i thought it was this other guy who was another big illustrator and i said no that was me and he said well um do, do they ever let you do freelance art and i said yeah i can i'm free to do that when you know when i have the time and he said, well, why don't you come to my studio? I might have something that I can give you to work on. So I did a couple of freelance jobs for him, and um, he made me an offer to hire me away. And um, mm. so I worked for him for about four or five years. And mm. that was an amazing experience because uh, I learned so much from him. Right. And so it was like sort of like getting paid to go to school. <laughs> um, but while, like within the first year that I was there, we got a call from Disney and they needed, um, Dave had already done some images for Disney for, um, I think advertising the theme parks. Okay. So he had done these airbrush, um, renderings of the characters, you know, where they're fully rendered, but still had the outline. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so they contacted him and he gave the job to me cause he knew I was kind of a cartoon comic guy, even though I was doing mostly photorealistic airbrush art for him. And um, so it was a poster for Cinderella, teaser poster for the re-release. Mm -hmm. And uh, Disney really loved it. And then they, they had me do um, the, the actual final release poster. And then from then on, it was just a stream of not only re-releases, because at the time, I think they were re-releasing two films per year into theaters. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm along with one brand new film. So they were doing like about three theatrical releases a year. And uh, so I got to I got to work on all the classics and do posters for, you know, my favorite films like Peter Pan and The Jungle mm -hmm. Book, and Bambi. And, uh, and then I also got to do the new ones. So I did The Little Mermaid and Oliver and Company and uh, Rescuers Down Under, uh, Roller Coaster Rabbit, mm -hmm. the Roger Rabbit short. Um, yeah, so, so that was, that was a lot of fun. So when you get a, po when you get a re-release project on your desk, do they give you any kind of direction for it, for those posters? Um, usually there's an art director at Disney who would send over a rough sketch of what they were, okay. what they had in mind. And then I would just sort of go from there and, um, accumulate as much reference. They wouldn't send over model sheets or anything on those. Mm -hmm. They would on the new films. Um, but I would just, you know, I'd find everything I could on Bambi, you know, and, and then <laughs> just try to draw it as on model as I possibly could. And then, uh, I'd turn in the drawing and then sometimes they would have a Disney animator do corrections on it. Mm -hmm. And then it would come back to me and I would paint it. So, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but in addition to the posters, um, you also did just general promotional art that appeared different places like packaging and ads and whatnot. Is that true? Yeah. Or am started, I making that up? We started getting a reputation. So eventually we were doing happy meal boxes and point of purchase artwork for McDonald's and, you know, basically anybody who had a tie in with a Disney film, mm -hmm. they started coming to us for the, for the artwork. When you have jobs like that, like you're doing, okay, I'm doing the whatever promotion for happy meal McDonald's. I mean, what are you thinking about as an artist? I mean, are you are you excited to be working on projects that are going to be getting such a wide audience and so many different eyes are going to be seeing your art? Or is it more frustrating since your hands are tied more or less creatively? Like there's only so much you can do with, with what you're given. I never had that uh, feeling of frustration. It was more excitement. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm such a fan of those characters that there was never this impulse to kind of do my own thing and put my mark on it uh, creatively. I always wanted to basically, I think throughout my career and anything I've done, I've always, whenever I'm working with an art director or an editor, my, my first impulse is to make them happy, to make their job easier. So um, I've always felt that as an illustrator, I was in a service position and, you know, my job was to just give the client what they want. Mm -hmm. If I'm doing my own thing, if I'm doing Roswell and I've got no editor directing me, no art director, 
then that's that's the time when I I've always felt like I could just do my own thing and be creative and not really worry about what other people think. Yeah. But um, for any illustration job or any comic job where I'm working with somebody else's characters, um, it's it was always it's always been um, job number one to just be respectful of the characters and to put myself second as an artist and to put the client first. Right. Yeah. Do right by the characters. Make the client happy. Yeah. Yeah. Can we talk for a minute about the Little Mermaid poster? Sure. It's become one of those urban <laughs> legends. Um, I know Disney fans love to talk about it. Um, <laughs> and from what I understand, it was completely unintentional. Is that true? Yeah. And actually, it wasn't the poster. It was. Uh, the, it was the the, the video the, box. Yes. The video yeah. cassette and the the <laughs> laser disc. Um, yeah, completely unintentional. I had I had the previous year I had done I had painted the artwork for movie poster and uh which by the way i got to see a couple of years ago up at the ronald reagan library because they had an exhibit up there of the, the original the the treasures of the disney archives right yeah. and yeah the, the original was on display and i hadn't seen it in i don't know over 20 years i guess wow um or almost 20 no over 20 yeah so yeah so that was that was weird. It was uh, kind of emotional, like seeing an old friend. <laughs> I don't know. It was strange. I didn't cry or anything, but <laughs> um, but yeah. Then a year later, the uh, this art director came over to the studio and met with Dave, my boss, and he was from Disney Home Video, which is in a totally different building. You know, it's it's not related to Disney feature film. <laughs> which was our main client. And we, up to this point, the studio had never done any work for Disney Home Video. Mm -hmm. So they had some trouble tracking us down and actually finding out who did the art for the original poster. Mm -hmm. So this art director came in with this piece of artwork and it's actually what ended up being on the back cover of the video, okay. which was the uh, under the sea scene with the fishes, uh, the fish and you know, all the characters playing musical instruments. Right, 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 right. So that was originally intended to be the front cover. And this art director told us that his 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 boss really loved the poster. So when he saw this art that was already finished and ready to go to print, um, he looked at it and said, yeah, it's nice, but um, I really love the poster and I want the video cassette to look more like that. Okay. So find the guy who did that and have him have him do something similar. So he had lost all kinds of time. He had a printing deadline. Um, this was like Thursday or Friday. Mm -hmm. And his printing deadline deadline was Monday. And so he was desperate. And my boss took me aside and he said, could you work over the weekend and get this thing done? Because he said, I'd really like to pick up this account. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, I'll... I'll you know, I don't have anything going on this weekend, so I'll just I'll just live here. Mm -hmm. So we got a rough sketch from the art director, and um, I did a tight pencil, and just went right into painting. And um, the painting process that I had was was kind of um, elaborate because with airbrush you have to spray through um, friskets. Okay. And, you have to mask off areas. So we had this right. elaborate process of acetate overlays. And so first I had to create all the acetate overlays based on my pencil drawing. And then I had to start painting it. So I, I you know, I spent as much time, I spent more time than I probably should on the characters. And then when it came to the background, I, I was just out of time. So I was probably painting the castle at, you know, four in the morning on Monday, you know, Monday morning after when having it was, when it was due. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I had to leave out, like, if you look at the original poster, the castle has a lot more detail. There's all these little sparkles and windows and, um, I just didn't have time for that. So I had to leave a lot of stuff out. And I think if you look at the actual film, the nature of those towers in the, the coral form mm -hmm. castle, you know, they're all, they're all very phallic. Yes. Um, it's just that the details disguise 
the fact that they look like penises yeah. a little bit. But with, without all that flash and sparkle and windows and things, um, this one tower just really, 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 really looks like a penis. <laughs> <laughs> and um, At I didn't four in the morning. It. You just didn't see it. I didn't see it. And, uh, you know, nobody at Disney saw it at first because they printed it. <laughs> Put it on thousands of uh, hundreds of thousands of video cassettes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it was some lady in Arizona, a housewife and mother who um, was actually her husband because I, I and I know this because I saw this on the news. I, I was actually watching ABC News and saw them interview this woman. And her husband had rented the video the day it came out from the supermarket, which had a video section. Uh-huh. And he brought it home and he was looking at the art and he sees this penis. And he, you know, I guess he probably put the video on for the kids and he's nudging his wife and he's going, hey, honey, check this out. Uh-huh. And look what some degenerate artist did. <laughs> and she just went ballistic. So she went down to the store and she demanded that they remove all these videos from the shelves <sighs> and they they refused however and i saw this on film they they put all the videos in brown paper lunch bags <sighs> with, with little mermaid <laughs> and magic marker written on the bags and they oh had, my god they had this whole shelf lined up with these paper bags that had little mermaid handwritten on them oh no it makes people only want to uh, yeah know, <laughs> they want it even more now. <laughs> right. Um, and and she called Disney and, you know, she demanded that they destroy all these videos and <laughs> you know, call have a recall, which obviously Disney didn't do. Um, but it was it was a big thing for a while. And I can't uh, even imagine having that much time. <laughs> like that much, that much energy to devote to something like that. <laughs> yeah. No. So, um, I mean, when did... Was there was there uh, fallout from that, like professionally with with the company? Almost, almost. Um, the the next project that I worked on was I did the poster for the Prince and the Pauper, which is a Mickey Mouse um, featurette. Mm -hmm. And so it was you know a big one sheet theatrical poster, and uh, Dave was you know his his. Um, process was, you know, after I finished a job, he would take it into the art director to get notes and then bring it back. So he was in the waiting area with my artwork for The Prince and the Pauper to talk to the art directors. And they were having a heated discussion about the Little Mermaid video box. <laughs> and so he's overhearing this and he overheard one of the art directors say, well, if I find out who did it, I'll make sure he never works for Disney again. <laughs> oh, no. So Dave's sitting there going, oh, my God, you know, this is, you know, the Disney account has now become a huge part of the sure. income to the studio. I can't afford to lose this. So he's thinking to himself, he told me this later, he said, he's thinking to himself, you know, I could keep my mouth shut and maybe they'll never find out. But if they do find out, I'll probably never have a chance to defend the piece. Right. So he decided to interject and he, he stood up and he went over and he said, Hey, I heard what you guys were talking about. And I just want you to know a piece of art came from my studio. And they were like, <gasps> <laughs> all the air went out of the room. <laughs> yeah. And he said, and Bill Morrison painted it. And you know, Bill, you've met Bill, you know, he loves Disney you know what kind of guy he is. He would never do this on purpose. Mm -hmm. And Dave said he argued with them for 20 minutes wow. because they were just like, you got to be kidding me. It's, it's anatomically perfect. How could you? <laughs> but Dave finally convinced them and um, they said, okay, we believe you. And um, we continued to get work from Disney. So, you know, we dodged that bullet, but wow. um it was crazy for a while. Like we would go to parties or I'd be in a comic shop and I'd hear people talking about it. <laughs> and the, the, it was like a game of telephone because the story would get better. Yes. The right. more it got told. So it Do started out, it started out as, um, you know, they would say a disgruntled Disney artist. Right. <laughs> That's the one that I've heard the most. 
And first of all, I didn't work for Disney. So even the, the initial story was not correct because I, <laughs> you know, I was a free, I, I worked for the studio and we, con- we had a contract with Disney. So mm-hmm. I didn't really work for them. Um, but then the story became they, they were firing him because they found out he was gay. Mm hmm. And then it was they were firing him because they found out he was gay and had AIDS. Oh and my then word. like the final version that I heard before it finally died down is that um, they were firing him because they found out he was a Satan worshiper. <laughs> <laughs> I never heard that one. <laughs> yeah, I actually heard somebody repeat that back to me and I was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> so, I mean. Um, Like you say, it's kind of died down a little bit. It still pops up every now and then. But I mean, when when these stories were circulating around, like, was it was it embarrassing for you or was there like a secret part of you that was like, yeah, success? (laughs) Like you've you've made it into all these conversations, whether people know it was you or not. Like people were talking. It wasn't like, yeah, success. But I did kind of enjoy it because I, I knew that. I was part of an urban legend and I've always loved urban legends. And I recognized immediately that this was something that was getting passed around and distorted and overblown. And, um, you know, people will be telling the story for years and they'll be saying, yeah, uh, the, you know, my best friend's cousin's brother was, you know, (laughs) I'll still see it. You know, you'll see like on Twitter or something, somebody will go to a thrift shop and and find the VHS version and they'll either buy it or they'll take a picture of it. They'll be like, look what I found. And it's like this, it's this whole, not a Holy grail because there's a lot of them that still exist, but it's this thing that people forget about until they see Mm -hmm. it again. And then they think it's the funniest thing ever. And the yeah. stories, the stories haven't changed. It's still people are saying this was this disgruntled Disney employee who was about to get fired, so he he decided to go out with a flash, you know, and he put this on the on the cover. Yeah, so the most an, the most thrilling thing is when um, they put it on Snopes.com. Yeah, <laughs> I actually saw that. I, because, as I was as I was poking around before this interview, I saw that it made it to Snopes. Yeah, that's the big leagues. Like, <laughs> <perfect> legends. <laughs> Yeah, I'm kind of jealous. I'm kind of jealous. Being part of an urban legend is not something that everybody can claim. <laughs> True. <laughs> so, yeah. in addition, in addition to um, potentially something happening with Roswell that you can't necessarily talk about, what else have you got coming up that we can look forward to? Hmm, that's a very good question. Everything that I, almost everything I'm working on now is still kind of top secret okay but there are top secret things being worked on yeah yeah i'm i'm um yeah i can't really i had to sign a confidentiality agreement oh i'm not asking you to reveal i just knowing that you're working on something is good enough i wish i could tell you more (laughs) yeah there's there's definitely a big thing i'm working on now that i can't talk about um but if you want to have me on again you know once it's uh, been announced then i'd be happy to absolutely let Um, us know Oddly, I'm doing a. Um, I got approached to do an album cover. Oh yeah. For a jazz guitarist named Dennis Coffey from Detroit. Okay. Who uh, he's he's a great guitarist. And he played on a lot of the great Motown songs, and um, so I'm doing an album cover for him. I haven't done anything like this for years and years, so this is I'm having a lot of fun with that. Um. I'm having a show back in my hometown of Lincoln Park, Michigan. The Historical Society there is doing like a retrospective show of my artwork. Awesome. So I'm I'm going through a lot of history and pulling out things to send to them. That's got to be gratifying, huh? Having a retrospective of your career from your hometown. It really is. Um, You know, I, I grew up in a suburb south of Detroit, Lincoln Park, Michigan. And... Um, I actually didn't, I I knew that there was one famous person from Lincoln Park, um, who was Preston Tucker. Um, I don't know if you know the Tucker automobile. Oh yeah, of course. Yes. Yes. There was a movie. um, Yeah. Tucker, a man in his dream. Yeah. 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 So anyway, he was from Lincoln Park and he was a cop during prohibition days and he used to catch rum runners bringing illegal hooch over from Canada. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because there was a, a creek, an inlet that um, comes from the Detroit River. So guys would come over from Canada in their boats, and then they would go up this little small creek 
into Lincoln Park and then unload their stuff. <laughs> and um, yeah, so so I actually knew the history of that, and I, I wrote him as a character or a character based on him into that Dead Vengeance thing that I mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, I knew there was I knew there was one famous person from Lincoln Park. Um, and then I found out while I was researching, I, I did a show called Detroit Pop, which was a, a pop art um, show at a, a gallery in Wyandotte, Michigan, which is just adjacent to Lincoln Park. And in researching that, because th- that show was all about famous artists, um, musical artists from Detroit. Um, so it was Alice Cooper and Susie mm-hmm. Quattro and Kid Rock and Eminem and you know, all the Motown artists. But I found out that, you know, the MC5, which is from Detroit, I found out that they were actually from Lincoln Park. Really? And it, it sort of, it blew my mind that they went to my high school and I never knew it. Like when I was in high school, they were, they were huge. Yeah. You know, and, and they're still considered like the, like, you know, they, they they had really one big hit, but so many other artists were inspired and influenced by them. Yeah. And you ask any rocker about the MC5, and they'll probably talk to you for three hours. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, the fact that they went to my high school and there was no plaque or there was no, you know, there was nothing commemorating the fact that they yeah. were there. Well, this historical museum has, has um, recognized them. And oh, so wow. There's a section now in the Lincoln Park History Museum on on Preston Tucker, on the MC5, and then now there's going to be one of me. Oh, wow. That's awesome. that crazy. I mean, <laughs> you know, to think that I'll be in a museum alongside the MC5 mm. is, you know, I, I'm still having a hard time comprehending that. Yeah. You've made it, right? <laughs> it's like... 20, 30 years later, you like finally you can say, like, ah, I've made it. My hometown has recognized me. <laughs> well, it's kind of sad that, you know, of, you know, that the, the town has really only produced <laughs> <laughs> three, you know, quasi famous uh, yeah. people, but <laughs> semi famous. But, <laughs> but um, that's amazing, you know, though. That's I, wish awesome. there were, I wish there were more, but I'm happy yeah. to be one of them. Yeah, no, that's that's amazing that that's happening. Yeah, and uh, when did, when is that uh, show going up? It opens October fifteenth. Okay, in when, Lincoln when, Park, Michigan. We will link to that um, when this episode goes up. So anybody in the area of Detroit or Lincoln Park needs to go check that out. If yeah, I were, oh, if I were closer, I'd be there. <laughs> it's going to be up uh, through the end of the year, so October fifteenth, okay. all the way through the end of the year. Excellent. Excellent. Awesome. Bill, thank you so much for your time. This has been an incredible conversation. It's so much fun. Oh, it was my pleasure. It went by fast. Well, that's it for this week on the Great Big Beautiful Podcast. You know what? On Free Comic Book Day every May, the number one free comic I'm always excited to get is the Bongo Comics one. I don't know. If you, yeah. It's one of the best ones mm-hmm. without fail every time. Well, you know what? It's back... Back when I was really into like reading and collecting comics, like when I first started, when I was, I guess I was, I don't know, middle school, high school, when I was like really in the thick of it, of like collecting and backing and boarding and everything. <laughs> I remember I was re- collecting um, the the original Simpsons bongos, and I think I still have a number one around here wow. somewhere. Uh, and it kind of blows my mind that it's still going. Yeah. They're still publishing them. And like, not only that, like, the Simpsons is in, in what? It's like it's in like in its twenty fifth season or something. Yeah, it's, it's, it's insane. Crazy. So like that show is still going with like hundreds and hundreds of episodes, and the comic is still going. And they're up to two hundred forty or something, some issues. It's like, how do they not have? How do they have that many stories to tell with the same characters? It's you know, un- I mean, it's unbelievable. Like it really is. I mean, you talk about thing. I mean, but then you think about like, okay, there have been thousands of stories told with Superman and Batman. Right. But like, I feel like, I don't know. I feel like that's kind of different because so many of those stories are ongoing, or they right. they involve the other superheroes, and it's like one story could take twenty issues. You know, whereas most of the Simpson stuff is mm-hmm. just done in one. You know, it's like one issue, twenty two pages, and you're done. Right. Well, you know, they age very well too. Oh yes. Yeah. They're. I mean. Yeah. 
that Lisa, she's been little forever, right? They've been, they just don't, I mean, they, they don't look <laughs> a day over six. <laughs> So if you like that episode, why don't you send a tweet on over to Bill Morrison, Jimmy yeah, on his can, Twitter? Yeah, he does. You can find him at Atomic Battery. That's where he is over on Twitter. That's an awesome Twitter username. Isn't it? Atomic and go, Battery. Go give him a follow, too, because he doesn't have that many followers right now, and, and, and he needs to have more because he's a pretty awesome guy. Yeah, no, definitely. Send him a tweet. Let him know that you enjoyed him on the show and that you appreciate him coming on just for us. That would be very nice. That would be nice. We'd, we'd appreciate that. <laughs> and while you're at it, while I'm asking you to do things, why don't you hit subscribe to our podcast? Maybe leave us an iTunes review. That would be great, too. We'd appreciate that as well. Yeah, I will I will pay you in kindness. I will, uh-huh. I will. And if we ever see you in person, we'll give you a big hug. Yes. Or exactly. a high five. Our, Which, whichever the fir- you prefer. Whenever the first Great Big Beautiful Podcast meetup is, I will give you a hug. We got to do not, that. Not that we you want to hug for me. Yeah, that'll happen. Well, maybe in yeah. a comic convention at some point. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. We'll make it happen. And guys, I've gotten a hug from Justin. They're pretty yes, good hugs. You, you want one? You want one of those? They're good. They're good. Yeah. I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys, you can find us on Twitter at the GBB Podcast, facebookcom slash the GBB Podcast, and I'm Justin. I'm at 140 Justin C on Twitter and Instagram and everything. And I'm, I'm Jamie at the Roarbots everywhere. Perfect. We will see you next week for two more great episodes. Yay. <laughs> Woohoo. Yay. Take care. <laughs> Bye. This podcast has been a production of the Geek Dad Podcast Network. If you've enjoyed this content, please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash geekdad.